Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at The Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Damon Linker of The Week, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and The Wall Street Journal, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. We're delighted to welcome back A.B. Stoddard of Real Clear Politics as our special guest this week. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot going on, but we'd like to begin with what happened in the Republican conference this week. Um, the members on a voice vote, nobody had to be recorded about the way he or she voted, uh, chose to, uh, defenestrate Liz Cheney. Um, they have not yet named her replacement. That will happen soon. Um, but the, um, so I'm going to begin with you, Damon, uh, the, um, the explanation that we've been hearing about why this needed to happen uh, was that Cheney, who was the conference chair, which is the third ranking position in leadership in the House uh, Republican caucus, um, that that Liz Cheney just wouldn't stop talking about the past. And uh, so what, what do you make of that argument? Well, um, I, I, maybe it wasn't a good idea to come to me first because I fear I will not give our listeners the red meat they they crave and deserve. Don't worry, um, I'll give it to them. I, yeah, good. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I said last week on the podcast, you know, on substance, I'm totally with uh, with uh, Liz Cheney on this. Uh, obviously we listeners know all the way through the run up to January 6th that I fretted that something like that would happen. It did happen. I think it was utterly appalling. I think the Republicans are a bunch of cowards in, in actually refusing to stand up to Trump over it, except for occasional moments where someone like uh, Mitch McConnell will give an impassioned speech about how terrible it was right after he voted to acquit Trump in the impeachment over that very act. But, um, you know, this whole kind of internal political machination thing that we've been living through with Cheney over the last week or so, uh, it doesn't really get me going that much. This is an internal Republican issue. Uh, the conference chair is a very inward facing role. If the Republicans are are kind of uh, off on their loony fringe about Trump, whether or not Cheney uh, remains in this position is kind of up to them. And I so I don't really see her removal as some like moment of, of jeopardy for the Republic or anything like that. Uh, so I, I have a hard time getting that upset about it. I liked her speech the other night. There were very good things in it about Trump and his danger to uh, our political system and democracy. A lot of the stuff at the beginning about the Cold War and fighting Russia, and now we have to fight China and wrapping the Trump business up in that, I thought was kind of off and reminded me of why I never liked her in the first place uh, before the more recent events about Trump. So, you know, in the end, uh, I, I sort of see this as just the latest chapter in a very long ongoing saga about uh, Trump and his role in the Republican Party, but not perhaps quite as an apocalyptic of, a, of an event. Some people are making it seem in the media. Wow, Damon. I have to say, in all the time we've been doing this podcast, I have I don't think I can ever remember a time disagreeing with you more uh, than today. You beg to that, differ. You do I it. I sure do. I beg to <laughs> vociferously differ. Wow. Excellent. Okay, but, but I'm going to um I'm gonna hold off and uh, and bring A B into this. Um uh, A B address whatever you like, but but uh, let me tee this up for you. Um this argument that it's that it's Liz Cheney who cannot escape from the past is pretty rich coming from the Republican Party that has devoted itself to nothing more than trying to rewrite the election laws in dozens of states to deal with a phantom fraud that never happened um, and, uh, and 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 you know, making their obeisance to the orange God King in Mar-a-Lago who talks about nothing else. So 
It's so interesting. Yes, in their actions, they are um, upholding the big lie to uh, make rules uh, to restrict voting in places where the system was, you know, thri- the results were thrice audited and certified and verified and, you know, the best, uh, most fair process they'd had in the middle of a, you know, once a century uh, pandemic. But they they try to avoid reporter questions, you know, largely on this kind of stuff. There's only a little ragtag bunch that's really out there, you know, probably fundraising off of it. Andy Biggs, Paul Gosar, you know, those types. But former President Trump continues to amplify it. And so and he has the big microphone. And so for Liz Cheney, it's one thing to see her colleagues, you know, duck and weave. Um, it's another, you know, to have him continue to, um, you know, to attack democracy by by the big lie while they stand by him. So you could make the argument that she's a conference chair and as the message maker, it is her job to not talk about those things and to just only talk about the things that bind and unite them and to just stuff it. Um, and I heard that argument from members, even who voted for her on February 1, that, you know, it's it's just some of our members in tough districts, they can't take this anymore. And if she wants to be a rank and file member like Adam Kinzinger, she can just, you know, scream from the mountaintops, but, but she can't be in leadership. You know, she, I think she, did, the, the beauty of Liz Cheney is she did this knowing she was going to lose her leadership post and knows that she could very well likely lose her seat in Wyoming. And that's why... Um, it's so interesting to watch her the other night on the House floor, just someone completely liberated, standing in her conviction, knowing she's largely alone. She knows the party is not going to be saved from itself, but she's, you know, she's going to go down trying. And I think that um, it is so depressing watching her when she came out of the conference meeting yesterday where she was ousted. And I was also told by members it was going to be a tighter vote than leadership wanted, which is why they canceled the secret ballot so that it wouldn't be an embarrassing situation. They're also completely divided over who to replace her with. First, it was Elise Stefanik and she was tapped by leadership. Then they started to get too much blowback about that. So to see her come to the to the microphones and and and, and remain emphatic about this and use language like you know, lying is not compatible with democracy and the constitution. And to see the members behind her just scurrying out. I I just yesterday wanted one member to go on Fox news and say, I don't, we're not, I'm not a liar. I I don't, I I don't like Liz Cheney challenging my reverence for the constitution. None of them are because they're as complicit as she's describing. And I'm as worried about this as anything Trump's ever done because, so I guess I'm going to agree with Mona that it is, it, it is existential because we cannot, she and Adam Kinzinger and, and, and Mitt Romney are not going to be able to save this party. It's lost. Um, it's unsalvageable. And it's, it is a threat to democracy because if we have one crazy party, it's going to make the other party crazier. And, and I just, I know where this is going. Linda asked last week, do we have a democracy if millions of Americans see this whole process as illegitimate and will continue to fight future results they don't like. Mona wrote about how this is an ongoing, they're basically planning the next deal. Um, why are Republicans in 2024, if, if there's an outcome they don't like, why are they going to certify that election in Congress if they have a majority? And then if there's a legitimate win by a Republican, why are the Democrats going to accept it? And this is where we are, and it needs to be treated with the urgency um, that that it demands. I mean, I I just think this is a total crack up moment. Um, Linda, yeah, let's let's talk about that a little bit more. Look, um, this is a um, what Liz Cheney was fired for. Her offense was not being willing to lie. Okay, so that's the. That, that is the measure of a good leader of the Republican Party now. You must be willing to engage in one of the biggest and most subversive lies that you can possibly engage in in a democracy, namely the lie that the election system itself is tainted, illegitimate, crooked, um, 
as as Trump is always de- describing every institution that that thwarts him in any way, it's always crooked. Well, now he has convinced one whole party that the election system is crooked and cannot be trusted. Arguably, that is the reason. Not arguably, I think it's pretty indisputable that that's the reason the Republicans lost control of the Senate because the Trump voters were convinced by Trump that it wasn't worth voting in the in the recount. Um, and uh, and so the Democrats won both of those seats. But um, A.B. alluded to a column I wrote where I was asking, look, if lying is the price of admission to leadership, what do we think is going to happen in 2024 if Republicans retake control, which I think is likely, um, and are asked to certify the Electoral College results? Well, exactly. Uh, I mean, I think there are really two problems here. Uh, Liz Cheney, in my view, would be happy to quit talking about Trump's lies if Trump would quit lying. You know, he she is not the one driving the conversation. It's Trump. But she also represents a Republican Party that you and I and uh, many others uh gravitated towards it because it was the party of ideas. It was the party of principle. It stood for certain things. Uh, Damon talked about, you know, not wanting to get into the Cold War discussions. Well, I am a Cold Warrior. Uh, I became a conservative because of the Cold War. I voted for Ronald Reagan first and foremost because of national defense and what I saw as the threat of communism spreading throughout the world, gaining a foothold even in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, and elsewhere, and the need for the United States to stand up for that. But I also was attracted to the party because it stood for certain principles and ideas. I don't know what the Republican Party of today stands for. It really does not have any kind of coherent governing philosophy. Uh, they certainly don't care about the deficit anymore. They're perfectly happy uh, to spend money uh, without paying for the programs. Um, they're, um, you know, they're very divided um, on uh, a host of issues, and they're about to to elect uh, the woman, a woman from New York, who is much, much more liberal than uh, Liz Cheney was. So I don't, you know, I really don't know what the party stands for. And they may win control of the House in 2022. Um, I don't know. Uh, if they do, and the 2024 election comes around, and Donald Trump is the standard bearer of the Republican Party. Uh, party, I would bet the farm that Donald Trump will not be reelected. But you raise the important question, what then happens if the Republicans are in control of the House and will they attempt to overturn the election? I just don't know the answer to that. And I fear uh, the worst. So Bill Galston, um, the way, well, one way to interpret Liz Cheney's speech, which I thought was excellent, um, the night before she was axed, uh, when she was referring to the Cold War and to and to battles of the past and to being a Republican, uh, one of the one of the features of the Cold War was that um, the United States stood for certain values in the world, liberty, but also truth. Um, one of the the characteristics of the old Soviet Union was that they engaged in disinformation as a as a warfare technique, um, and uh, they were constantly uh, spreading lies. and And one of the things that we attempted to do was to was to bat them down. Never forget the uh, United Nations uh, uh, Security Council uh, session where. Um, the, uh, the the Soviets had shot down, um, it turned out to be an accident, but in any case, they had shot down KAL 007 and, and they kept denying it and they kept issuing all of these statements that were completely, you know, bogus. And, uh, and then, you know, the U.S. Uh, representative played the audio of that we had intercepted of their pilots shooting it down. And it was one of those moments where it was like, yeah, they, they just lie and lie and lie. 
anyway, um, she does not want to be associated with lying um, and uh, lying as a policy. And and here's here's my question for you, Bill. Um, one of the things that made Cheney, um, uh, that frightened Cheney about the, the drift of the party um, was that not only were they presenting a lie, a big lie to the world that undermines confidence in, in, in our democracy, but also they were lying to themselves. Um, apparently, they were withholding at a meeting of the um, Republican uh, uh, Election Committee, the, the NRSC, whatever it's called, CC, um, they withheld data showing that Trump was incredibly unpopular in key swing districts. This this data was not shared. Um, so um, comment on any of that, if you will. <laughs> uh, tell you the truth, Mona. Uh, you You're know, with so, Damon? <laughs> you know, so much has already been said, although as Mo. You'd all famously pointed out, not everybody has yet said it. <laughs> uh, the uh, you know the, the ouster the the ouster of Liz Cheney, I think, uh, simply put a period and an exclamation point on the end of an era in the Republican Party that had already expired. Quite a quite a long time ago, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, I I would argue that Donald Trump's you know scythe like mowing down of all of the other contenders for the Republican presidential nomination in 2016 uh, was pretty solid evidence of the fact that even by 2016, the Republican Party was no longer the party uh, that you and Linda and others were attracted to. Uh, and that raises some very important historical questions. You know, when did the people who joined the party for that reason lose touch with the rest of the party? You know when when did they when, when did they stop understanding the drift of the party? Uh, the the idea of big pervasive lies uh, is not particularly new in the Republican Party. Remember birtherism, which gained a remarkable purchase among the Republican rank and file. Uh, People believe what they want to believe. Well, hang on one second. Can I just, I'm sorry. I just have to push back a little bit there because yes, birtherism was horrible and it was, and it was racist. Um, but there was a widespread belief among Democrats that Bush lied us into war, which is also not true. So. Well, but uh, look, we can have, a, we can have a long discussion about that, Mona, and I'm not, I'm not going to argue that point right now. Uh, but it is the case that the Republican rank and file had begun to be susceptible uh, to believing a lot of things that weren't true. And Donald Trump didn't invent that strategy. Uh, he continued it. Uh, and my own analysis, for what it's worth, is that the Republican Party turned into a majority party in part because it was able to attract white working class voters whose disaffection with Democrats had begun as early as 1968. Uh, but that part of the Republican Party never got very much you know, for this historic shift uh, that it had executed. Certainly not that much on, on the economic front. And frankly, a lot of the cultural talk for much of the period after the white working class joined forces with the Republican Party was just that, talk, without a lot of action. And so you had a massively disaffected portion of the Republican Party uh, growing in strength and frustration throughout Barack Obama's second term. And that frustration finally culminated in the in the victory 
of the long suppressed populist wing of the Republican Party, which had never gotten its due in the actual policies of the Republican Party. If you ask me for a silver bullet explanation as to why we are, where we are, when we are, that would be it. The elite, the leaders of the Republican Party lost tr- lost touch with their own rank and file, uh, and I would say didn't even understand what uh, you know what the Tea Party revolt was really about. And it wasn't about a balanced budget, and it wasn't about small government. It was about the things that Donald Trump articulated. Well, okay, it's um, those are a lot of lot of big topics, but it's time actually for us to move on to our next subject. But um, I think it's I'll just say this: I think it's really hard to know, um, looking back, what the Tea Party was about. I mean, if you take them at their word at the time, you know, all their little signs that they held up, taxed enough already. Or, you know, we can't afford this or, you know, nobody bailed me out, that kind of thing. Um, it, it didn't, it sure didn't seem to be uh, racial or ethnic or class resentment. It didn't present that way. Now, maybe that's what it turned out to be. But uh, it's very, it's very hard to, um, it's hard to know what all those people were thinking. And in any case, at the time, it sure looked like, uh, it sure looked and sounded like objection to the to the uh, expansion of government. But no, right. it was object. It was objection to expanding government for other people. Well, that's very right. different. No, that that is true. But you know what? That's always the case. I mean, people people are always in favor of more for me and less for him. I mean, that's that's a a, a universal. So, no, um, so nobody believes in limited government, really. Um, well. <laughs> Linda and I do. Yes. <laughs> Name five others. <laughs> Ex- except that we do want a strong defense. If we we don't we want to we don't want to see that shrink. Well, I I I want to see a strong but smart defense. I, yeah, I, I, I agree do with think you. There. We had to we had to learn some lessons from uh, from the adventures of the early twenty first century that that were difficult. But okay, let us move on to a topic that I've been reading about and thinking about. But uh, A B, you had a piece that really spurred me to 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 make this a part of our program because it was um, uh, it led me to Catherine Giles excellent uh, YouTube video. And um, it's a topic that uh, is getting a tremendous amount of grassroots interest. So tell us about, uh, this is an election reform issue. It's it's called a number of things. It's either um, rank choice or final four or final five. Can you give us a short primer on what this is? Yes, uh, this is actually uh, not ranked choice voting, but it is a combination of some steps into a new system that um, Catherine uh, Gale, who's the founder of the Institute for Political Innovation, uh, termed final five voting. It gets rid of partisan primaries and plurality voting. So it is now an open primary, uh, which anyone can join, can run in. And from any party, um, and they can g- make it into the final five um, uh, primary winners by obviously appealing to the broadest coalition of voters in that district. Once those five are chosen, they campaign between the primary and the general, appealing to the broadest coalition of voters in that district. So they're naturally running more on a results agenda than they are against each other because they hope when they face each other on general election day in instant runoffs where the choices are ranked to be someone second, third, or fourth, or fifth choice if they are not their first. So they're not running against candidate A, B, C, and D. They're running on a platform that speaks to the concerns of the voters. Then when they are elected, the person who on election day- Wait, wait, um, don't- as a- <clears throat> So can you go back a step yeah. when they are elected? So, so the, the people who gather in the room and are, and are, and are pulling these ballots together, how do they do it? Well, I, I don't know how instant runoffs happen, but I'm sure it's done by, by either paper ballot or, or machine. That's, that's not my bailiwick, but no, but I mean, the, doesn't the person who doesn't get as many, who gets the fewest first choice ballots? Oh, I apologize. Per- yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. So yeah. That that's person what I mean. is eliminated first. Okay. 
and then people's choices are resorted in their in that order of God. preference. Yes. I apologize. Yes. yes. No, no. I thought you I thought you meant like technically. No, no, no. How no. we were gonna look at all the ballots like those <laughs> clowns in Arizona right now and right, 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 right. looking for okay. the bamboo. Yeah. So so you in this system, which which is again we know that that primaries are the driving force between the behavior of members of Congress and then the results that we get, which is nothing. And the problem is that even if they participate in bipartisan cooperation, then they make themselves targets in their primary from the right or the left. Primaries are decided by a small portion of voters in a district. They are not representative. Most of us don't vote in primaries, and they are often... <clears throat> hardened partisans or single issue advocates. And then that person, when they are chosen, often by a plurality vote like Donald Trump in his primary for the presidency in 2016, where you're winning with 39%, but 61% of the field is, you know, the voters are supporting somebody else. Our legislators have to respond to that group of voters and not the majority of their district. And the voters in these gerrymandered districts, which are either blue or red, who vote on election day do not matter. Only the primary voters matter because that's where the decision is made. So by getting rid of the prime, the, uh, the partisan primary process and then also combining uh, getting rid of plurality voting, you're making sure that the person who is chosen has ended up appealing to the broadest um, part of that electorate of the voter, you know, the voters of that district per se. Final four, not final five, but a version of it, final four has passed in Alaska. This is why Lisa Murkowski will not, no matter how much screaming uh, President Trump, former President Trump does from his suite in Mar-a-Lago does, face a Trump-backed primary challenge the way Liz Cheney will and Adam Kinzinger will, because she is now in a system of final four where she will go into a primary where they will pick five of the most pop, you know, the, the people with the top five vote getters. And then those, those top four, excuse me, will go to the top four in the general election in Alaska. Again, always campaigning to, and then governing for the broadest cross-section of your voters. This is unlike changes to gerrymandering and campaign finance and all these things that we can hope for in 25 years actually something Catherine believes is achievable in the next four to six years. Alaska has passed it. There is a bipartisan bill in Wisconsin. This has to be done at the state legislature level. Uh, and um, this is something that would dramatically change the incentive structure uh, and change our results. Right now, our incentives are perverse. It's all about those primaries. It's not about cooperation. There's no competition, therefore no innovation. But also, once you get in, uh, once you're running again, um, you are you don't have to run on results. You just have to fend off that challenger. So if we had eight more Lisa Murkowskis in the Senate, just imagine how quickly that would break the stranglehold. Right now, Mitt Romney's an island. Maybe Susan Collins, if she doesn't run again. But they're always worried about the primary. And that's why the Problem Solvers Caucus in the House and the senators who work with them at the table are always making sure that they're, they're still, while they're negotiating and trying to pass bipartisan legislation, protecting each other in primaries because they want that problem solver to come back. So they have to survive their primary and fend off that challenger from the left or right. It's very perverse incentive structure, and it's hard to, to cooperate once you're in Congress unless you break that incentive structure and bring in more competition and bring in more accountability and more innovation. That's why I think it's, it's such an exciting concept and construct because it's actually doable. Partisans like fundraisers and campaign consultants and all of the people that have their jobs now in politics will not lose. Nobody loses in this. The voter gains because we change the rules and the incentive structure. But the the parties survive. Everything stays. We're just we're not changing the outcome of who wins. We're changing how they run and what they do when they get to Congress. Linda, according to Unite America, um, ten percent of voters determined the results in eighty-three percent of congressional seats in twenty twenty. 
Well, that's, um, I guess, a little scary. Uh, as somebody who generally does uh, vote in primaries, um, I was at first extremely skeptical of this idea, but as Abby, uh, AB rather uh, describes it, uh, it seems to make a little bit more sense. But let me ask a question because I don't know the answer to this. Um, maybe I don't have a second choice. Maybe I really only have one choice. And let's say it's 2016 and I'm voting in a primary uh, for the Republican nominee. And I really, really want Marco Rubio to vote. And I get you know to rank three people. Can I put Marco Rubio in each of my three spots and uh, My guess is he would not have fallen off in the first round because he wouldn't have gotten the least votes. Um, Is that possible to do? And is is it possible still to game the system? Uh, Or do you simply uh, throw your vote away if uh, your person doesn't come up in the first round? From the way I understand it, yeah, the, that you if you don't make five, if you don't choose four or five candidates, depending on the system, if it's four or five, you're you're going to be you're not going to have you're you're not going to be in each round if you don't if you only pick one candidate. I imagine picking Rubio three times would only count as Rubio once. Once, but again, these state legislatures would be adopting uh, individual processes. And I don't know, you know, exactly how they would work, but yes, it's, it's that it's that the person who ends up, um, being the winner has appealed to the broadest, to the biggest number of people. But if you only pick one person, then you're limiting your you're chance. Limiting. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, it, it all seems very complicated to me. I, I consider myself a, you know, reasonably intelligent person. Um, <laughs> Throwing something like this into the mix, um, maybe in the primaries because you have a smaller uh, group voting, and maybe it'll uh, it will work. Uh, but you know, in multi-party democracies, I can see this not necessarily coming up with the best results. So, count me still somewhat skeptical. Bill Galston, you think a lot about election reform issues. Um, what do you make of this one? Well, uh, I will give you, at least this time, a political scientist's answer. Uh, And that is that in the past, there has been a considerable gap between the theory of political reform and the consequences of a particular reform. Uh, It is possible that this reform will work as advertised. That would be a very good thing for the country if it did. Uh, This is one reason why we're lucky uh, to have a federal republic rather than a national republic. We can try it out in Alaska, and I hope in half a dozen other places, and then have some experience before we go forward. Uh, I remember when the California top two system uh, was the hot prospect for election reform, and follow-up studies indicate that it hasn't made as nearly as much difference as its proponents hoped. Maybe this one will break the spell. Uh, as someone who has been victimized by institutional changes within my own political party for 50 years, I, I guess I have some, some you know, drummed-in skepticism about this, but I think it would be a shame not to give it a good, honest try in multiple diverse locations, and then move forward if it works the way uh, its proponents say it will. Wait, do, do I do I therefore um, conclude, Bill, that you're for the old smoke-filled room method, <laughs> as I still am? <laughs> uh, to, well, you know, to tell you that you know, I have often said uh, that if somebody put me in a locked room facing a console with two buttons, A and B, and I wasn't allowed uh, I wasn't allowed to leave the room until I made a choice. And A was the system that existed up until 1968 in the Democratic Party, and B was the system we have now. Uh, I would push A without a moment's hesitation. Uh, yeah. and, and I know... I I know the terrible history of politics under A. All I can say in its defense is that politics under B within the Democratic Party has been even worse. Yep. 
And the Republican Party, by the way, followed the Democratic Party's lead in this uh, for no obvious reasons, but uh, but they also yeah, adopted the same policies on primaries and stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, Damon, uh, as uh, Bill mentioned, they've already done something like this a little bit in California. It hasn't really um, changed things that much. But but uh, here's a here's another thing that that uh, Bill referred to, namely that uh, we have a federal system so we can let the states be de- um, laboratories of democracy and let a few try it out, see how it works. Um, but if H.R. 1 were to pass, it w- that would not be possible, right? The Democrats want to federalize uh, many aspects of, uh, of how we vote. So that's an argument against H.R. 1, isn't it? I guess it is. And, and I'm not in favor of most of H.R. 1, so that doesn't really bother me. I I do agree that most election law should remain at the state level, and certainly this kind of experimentation should be allowed, and it it could be a good thing. Um, On the reform itself, um, I guess I'm of two minds, meaning that it, it has two steps. First of all, the kind of open primary, which is sometimes called a jungle primary or a nonpartisan blanket primary. And then there's the the second round uh, ranked choice voting component. I'm very much in favor of trying the first. Um, and there are, as we've said, there are some states that are doing this. Um, it, it is a good way of incentivizing people who are running in an open primary to appeal to the district as a whole, as opposed to just the most partisan of the partisans on my own partisan side. Um, and that can be a good thing. But then I frankly don't understand why you wouldn't just follow up by then having a runoff between the top two in that open primary. Uh, then that would be something like the French system where you have a whole bunch of people, far left, far right, center right, center left, all competing. And then you take the top two, the last time that was Macron uh, and uh, Le Pen. And they then run against each other. And then whoever wins that two-person matchup is the winner. And that person automatically has a majority because there are only two uh, in the in the battle. I think that would accomplish the same thing that we're trying to get to. I think, A.B., with this suggested reform, which is to try to build out majority support rather than a kind of factionalized extremism, but without having to use ranked choice voting, which I am not a fan of for the reason that Linda said, it's very complicated. It's not, it's like running the nation's politics, like an LSAT logic game (laughs) where you're like, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, I, I, I really don't like this candidate, but I sort of like that candidate. Should I make that person two or three? And then when will mine drop out and the other one drop out? I mean, as far as building a kind of consensus for governing, it really, I think, confuses uh, confuses the public opinion. It translates public opinion into office holders in a way that really is is very hard to trace out and so i think could could create a lot of problems especially in a country like this as we've seen where so many people are already suspicious of the outcome of elections this would be like saying hey we'll fix that by making it 10 times more complicated so we can't even explain exactly how we got a winner so that's a big problem and lastly um i would add in on uh, to jump on one of bill's points that we should not overestimate the ability of these kinds of electoral structural things to fix our problems. Um, Take Israel, for example. Israel has the furthest thing from our system. It's completely a proportional parliamentary system. Uh, They have historically had a very low threshold, so they have tons of parties. They raised the threshold not that long ago, but there are still tons of parties, and they can't elect a a viable government. They're going into what, what potentially... There could potentially be announced soon, what is it, the fifth election in two years? Uh, because, And the reason why is because they cannot reach a consensus that produces a majority. And 
that that is a function partly of that system, but it shows that even with a totally different system, you can have a lot of democratic breakdown in a way that's totally different from our democratic breakdown. But yet it shows that there there really is no there really is no system that will fix a, uh, an issue if the issue is that your cleavages, the divisions within your electorate um, are particularly deep and cut across uh, differences in a way that don't uh, easily get translated through the system. So um, I, I, I think like everybody, it sounds like, find this an intriguing idea, but I remain a little skeptical uh, about it in all of its respects. So those are all great points. Let me just add the one just little demurral, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> one thing it does seem to me that this kind of rank choice uh, voting can do is um, prevent a the, the rise of demagogues, because as we saw in the uh, gubernatorial election just take that just took place here in Virginia, um, it was it was a mess and it was complicated. They had thirty nine different uh, locations of sort of a drive by convention sort of thing. You had to be a delegate first to even vote, so it wasn't even a primary. But uh, I think there were something like thirty thousand people, or maybe it was 300,000, I don't remember, who were actually eligible to vote. But in any case, um, what ha- there, was, there was a candidate, Amanda Chase, um, who called herself Trump in heels, who had encouraged the, uh, late, the last president to declare martial law uh, and, and rerun the election or, you know, and so on and so forth. So she is just a horror show. And, um, and yet she had the support of that, you know, incredibly small but passionate Trump uh, constituency in Virginia. They did a ranked choice voting thing um, there. there, And so what that enabled was that not just that um, people could, um, so people could express those who did not want her could express how upset they would be with her at all. Right. So they would put her at the bottom of the, of, of the list of second choice, you know, way at the bottom fifth choice or whatever, so that when the thing was accounted, um, this, this, uh, possible plurality that she might have been able to get, uh, on a first round, uh, didn't allow her to be the winner and she was not the winner. So anyway, that's, that's a thought. Uh, I, I, but- would ju- I would just add that if people are interested in watching ranked choice voting in action, we have the New York mayorality election coming up uh, very soon, and they are using ranked choice voting for the first time. Uh, so, you know, Andrew Yang is running and a whole bunch of other people. So it'll be a great uh, an occasion to kind of see it in action, to kind of watch and see who comes in first, second, third, fourth, how that gets translated into uh, who ends up on top. It'll be interesting. Okay. Okay, great. All right, Bill, um, we're about to move on to our next topic. So if uh, you have a short comment on this, that's great. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you to hold it until we come back Very, to this some other time. Very short. Okay. Uh, in a, you know, in a political party, 70% of whose rank and file believe that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president president of the United States, no system will save candidates from having to subscribe to falsehood in order to make progress politically. Glenn Youngkin, who you're the victor uh, in this in the Virginia gubernatorial process on the Republican side, to this day has not, has not acknowledged that Joe Biden is the legitimate president of the United States. So there are limits to what these institutional devices can do. So you're absolutely right. He did not, and I could not possibly support someone who wouldn't acknowledge reality. On the other hand, I mean, it is better that he is the nominee than than Amanda Chase. All right, let us uh, turn now to um, the baby dearth uh, in America. In 2020, uh, the uh, birth rate dropped 4% which is not shocking since we were in the middle of a pandemic, but um, it is a continuation of a steady decline in births. This is the sixth consecutive year of decline um, and uh, puts the United States now in the same category as many other countries in the OECD, uh, where we are failing. We are not at replacement 
levels of our population. Um, so, um, AB, uh, one of the uh, one of the things this raises is that um, in order to maintain our economy, in order to maintain our standard of living, to say nothing of our programs that um, support the aged and the infirm, we need young workers. And yet increasing immigration is something that's also just incredibly divisive in our country. Yeah, um, it's hard to talk about that as a solution um, but this is a but this is a problem that doesn't really have easy solutions. I think immigration there's a case to be made for that. I think that we are in a very strange time with new generations. This is a sort of a societal and cultural problem where it's not just that some people of childbearing years have been have come up in a time of great recession and responded to that with diff, different attitudes. I mean, there's a real you know, th- th- we have a huge drop in abortion rates um, and we have uh, less interest in, in marriage uh, and less interest in, in um, childbearing. And it's, you could say uh, the government needs to incentivize people to be, to raise children um, and, or, and that's going to cost a lot of money. And, you know, are we even fit to do that anyway? Um, and then, you know, you could look to immigration. I don't. I don't know what the solution is. I, I. just think that this is a. This looks increasingly like it's not just a response to economic instability, um, and that it's sort of new mores that are going to be with us in younger generations for a while. So, Linda, um, one thing that the statistics tell us is that people are having fewer children than they say they want. There are any number of measures, the general social survey and Gallup and many other things that show that people tend to want more than two children as their ideal. And they're having less than two children, uh, in reality. Um, and so something is getting in the way of people's, of people's desires, um, if if you can believe what they what they tell pollsters, um, look, it, it it is very complicated. AB is right about that. Uh, this is a dramatic cultural shift that is taking place really throughout the world. It, it's taking place in Mexico. Uh, Mexico, you know, still has a replacement level uh, population um, as as I think uh, last I checked, uh, but they're. Uh, decline in in population growth is is quite dramatic. So it's not even something that is necessarily tied to economic development and it's just the rich countries in which women are choosing to have fewer babies. Um, A lot of it, I think, does have to do with education. Women um, have more choices now. And as a result of having more choices, they also have decided to defer childbearing until later years. And like it or not, uh, even with fertility treatments and other things, it is more difficult to get pregnant uh, in your 40s than it is in your 20s. So if you put off having babies a very long time, uh, you may find that you're not uh, as easily uh, going to be able to become pregnant. But I do think that um, there are two things. I mean, one is population decline in the United States over the last uh 10 years, I think has been primarily driven uh, by uh, decreases in immigration. It's not just that we're letting in fewer people. It's that immigrants who come to the United States tend to have more children on average than the native born do. So there, um, there is an expansion that takes place by adding the numbers, but then uh, there is a natural increase that uh, that happens. So until their children get until to, their get, children right, then, then their wait. children act just like all other that's Americans. That's right. Well, they assimilate yeah. that yes. you know, by the third yes. generation. 
the grandchildren of immigrants are fully assimilated and it doesn't yeah. much matter what country they came from. Right. Uh, but I do, you know, one of the things that, that I think we have to think about is expanding productivity in ways other than uh, expanding the labor force. Um, I mean, I think it's desirable to expand the labor force. I'm in favor. That's a quick fix. We could do that um, easier. Uh, but investments in... Um, Education, investments in technology are other ways uh, to expand our product or to increase our productivity. And if we don't do that, if we don't start to um, have greater productivity, we are simply not going to be able to maintain the standard of living that we've uh, grown used to. And, you know, we've always believed that, you know, that progress only went in one direction, uh, but we're starting to see that progress slow and uh, it's pretty dramatic. And, and this last, uh, the census, you know, this is the lowest uh, expansion in our growth that we've seen since the 1930s when we were in a Great Depression where we actually had um, declines in population. And this is not an absolute decline, but it is the uh, slowest growth that we have seen uh, in our nation's history. Bill, one of the things uh, that's frustrating is that, um, you know, I was listening to a podcast about this uh, Census Bureau data, and uh, they spent a whole 15 minutes talking about how the United States doesn't have as generous um, family leave and and uh, maternal uh, benefits as other countries, and that this you know could be part of the reason. But they never said. Well, it took them a long time to get around to saying, "Oh yeah, actually in Europe." where they have these much more generous social safety net um, programs, uh, their fertility rate is even lower than ours. So while it may be a good idea to provide more support for mothers, and I'm all for it, um, it, it's not, you can't, we can't delude ourselves into thinking that that alone is going to boost fertility. I absolutely agree with you, Mona. That's one of the points I was going to make uh, that pro-natalist policies usually fail wherever mm -hmm. they're tried mm -hmm. uh, because, because whatever is driving this change, it's not principally a matter of economic incentives. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, it's clear that some combination of increasing prosperity, uh, increasing education and incre and multiplying options for women uh, comes together uh, to motivate uh, a lower fertility rate. Uh, I've long pondered the gap between the number of babies families have and the number uh, that they say they want, and I've come to a somewhat contrarian conclusion about this. Uh, the generals famously say that the plan of battle never survives the first contact with the enemy. Uh, and I think it's entirely possible that people who start out wanting large families uh, realize for reasons not entirely connected to economics that maybe they should uh, downsize a little bit. Uh, I, don't, I, 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 don't mean, I don't mean to be offhand here, uh, but having children is really hard, even if you have lots of money. Uh, and uh, I think it's... I think it's possible that after the first and certainly after the second, a lot of families ask themselves, well, do we really want a third or a fourth? And the, the answer is no, even though in principle they could afford it. Uh, the final point I'd want to make here uh, is that uh, uh, you can see this happening in a massive way in China. Uh, for decades, China has repressed its birth rate, and now they're figuring out that their population is going to start to shrink within 10 years unless they do something about the one-child policy. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of, for, for the Chinese government, a lot of women uh, who were initially perhaps forced into this policy or their children uh, have now begun to experience some benefits of having only one child. And it is not at all clear 
especially given rising prosperity in China, that they're going to be able to turn around these expectations. You know, how are you going to keep them down on the farm now that they've seen Paris? So the, you know, we are talking about a very complicated phenomenon, uh, which, if recent economists are to be believed, will have a gen- generally inflationary bias uh, as the population shifts towards people who are no longer s- saving but are spending down what they've saved up. Uh, yeah, I just I would just uh, add for the record that um, China did repeal its one child policy a number of years ago, uh, switched it to a two child policy. But uh, but you're right, they are they are struggling with uh, this declining population question, um, among many others. Um, Damon, one aspect of this, unless you'd like to comment on anything that we already discussed, I, I'd like to turn it in a little different direction, though, because. One of the things that was really striking um, in the past week online was that Elizabeth Bronig, a columnist for the New York Times who is uh, a mother, wrote a piece on for, for Mother's Day, a really lovely piece about how she had her first child at age 25, which is considerably younger than her cohort, that is, meaning college-educated women, uh, tend to. And uh, anyway, it was a nice reflection on how she doesn't have any regrets about it. And, you know, a little, little bit about, you know, sociology and a little bit about the joys of motherhood. And she was attacked really kind of brutally um, on Twitter. Uh, people saying, uh, you know, uh, let's see, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing this woman it was a tremendous personal achievement to be repeatedly knocked up by an internet troll she met in high school. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, p- famous uh, feminists like Amanda Marcotte and others, you know, were just hated this piece. And, uh, you know, that's a symbol, a, a symptom of, um, of something that I think we don't acknowledge too often because, you know, feminists or, you know, sort of extreme feminists always claim that they're all about choices and that it's all about what women want. But here you go. A woman says, I did this. I'm happy with my choice. And they, they, they dump all over her. Oh, yeah. It was another edifying day on Twitter.com. Um, yeah, I, it was it was really quite something. Um, and, and it really made me very angry and wanting to defend Liz, uh, who I know a little bit and uh, who I whose work I I frequently disagree with. But I think she's an important voice out there. She does good reporting and is just a, a very lovely human being. And I found her her essay about uh, becoming a mother uh, at the at the moderate age of 25 uh, to be quite charming and moving in a way uh, and a very suitable Mother's Day essay. But the, the attacks, you know, I don't know what to say about it other than, uh, you know, beyond the the average tendency of Twitter to somehow inspire people to go crazy. Um, there is a way in which I think there's a touchiness on the part of some some people on the cultural left that if if like it's as if their beliefs are very fragile and that if you if you merely suggest that doing it another way is a, is a perfectly acceptable choice then you're somehow trying to impose this on me by simply implying I'm doing it wrong yeah. and and I think that that's that's ridiculous and it shows a kind of uh, really deep hostility to pluralism on the part of some people. Uh, it's as if their own beliefs are so fragile, they require to live in a world where everybody simply affirms their own personal view. Uh, and and I, I, I don't like that at all. And I think it's bad. Uh, in the end, um, Perhaps uh, Liz Bruni got the last laugh because uh, I don't know if you saw, but she she's uh, leaving the New York Times where she published this piece to go to the Atlantic. Uh, and I oh, suspect, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh. and I, this was announced uh, in the midst of all of this. And I, I didn't see any evidence of anyone at the Times going after her on this, but she's had other. Uh, kind of nasty Barry Weiss style uh, problems at the times, uh, kind of more. It's amazing because, you know, this woman, 
you know, I, I'm, she is a Bernie Sanders supporting, you know, kind of lefty socialist type when it comes to economic issues. Um, so I guess her great sin is being happily married and a mother. <laughs> and, and she is a believing Catholic and she, she makes that known uh, and she has obliquely implied over the years that she's personally opposed to abortion for moral reasons, but as far as I know, has never written a, a, a column actually defending it or saying that that's the right thing for anybody else. But the mere fact that people can glean that she's in some respect pro-life makes her uh, otherwise allies on the left go completely bonkers. It's it's really not none of this is a good statement for the char- about the character of our public life and debate frankly. It's it's really pretty no. sad. And I would just also like to say in response to to Bill's comments and to uh, some other things that, look, I, I know there's a lot of attention that gets paid in our time to how tough it is to be a parent. But I have to say, it's for me, just speaking for myself, I still believe it was the greatest thing I ever did in my life. And um, I, if I had gotten an earlier start, I would have had more children, not fewer. So uh, some of us really love being parents. Um, and I think maybe many more than you would sometimes know from looking at Twitter, for example. Oh, whoa, 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 Mona. Uh, <laughs> you know, having, having our son was uh, certainly the best thing that ever happened to us. And if we could have had another, I think we would have. Uh, but I was just commenting on the fact, and I've, I've seen this you know, looking at the next generation down, uh, that there is an unrealistic expectation about what it's going to be like. And, and sometimes sometimes the reality has a sobering effect on, Fair on desired family Fair enough. I, I know, I know. I didn't I don't disagree with that. I just I just think it's also important to stress how great it is too. So I just wanted to say that. Yes. All right. We now come to our highlight or low light of the week. And we'll start with you, A B. I am highlighting a piece from April 30th from the Washington Post, a lengthy piece by Mark Fisher that I thought was riveting and scary, but extremely helpful. And it's how extremists are using popular culture to lure recruits um, from the gaming platforms to autism communities online. This is uh, something that the four of you are probably very familiar with, but I really think for the listeners, this is a great piece not to get a a degree in QAnon, but to just learn about how this happens online and that the way in to spreading white supremacist hatred doesn't begin uh, with explicit messaging. It begins with, you know, jokes and memes and cartoons and community. And then before you know it, people are playing Black Lives Splatter. Um, So I think it's just a really helpful thing in this age, this crisis of disinformation that we're in for, for people to share with each other, to learn about how community you know, is is actually, and culture is actually what draws these people in, not race war, but the how, how, you know, just shrewd the process is for luring recruits and radicalizing people. I learned a lot from it, and I think it's worth a share. Okay, thank you. Bill Galston. Well, I'm going to tout a piece by a venerable political observer, Jeff Greenfield, uh, published in Politico a few days ago. I don't have the exact date, uh, but his his thesis stated simply is that media chatter about a civil war within the Republican Party uh, has it wrong. Uh, the war, if there was one, is over. Uh, and the Trump faction has won it decisively. Uh, and the people who disagree with that faction will either be silenced or expelled. Uh, there is no third choice, which raises some very interesting strategic questions about what people like Liz Cheney and people who celebrate what she did 
will do practically as a political matter in the wake of their complete rout within what used to be their own party. Linda. Well, that's very depressing, Bill. Um, I'm going to give a somewhat uh, more um, uplifting, uh, sober, uh, but not totally pessimistic uh, recommendation. It's a piece in Commentary Magazine for May. It's called China's Creative Challenge and the Threat to America by Hal Brands, who's at Johns Hopkins SICE and also at the American Enterprise Institute. And one of the things he does is to acknowledge that the United States was very slow to recognize uh, China's uh, threat uh, to us uh, in, militarily uh, and its uh, growing influence. But he also, I think, nails it when he talks about many of the internal problems that China has that may, in fact, thwart uh, that threat. And I think he's somewhat optimistic that the United States uh, will be able to, to meet that challenge. So I think it's well worth reading. Interesting. Okay. Damon. Okay. Well, just so that our listeners don't think I've somehow gone soft on the threat of authoritarianism at home, uh, it's in that spirit that I offer this um, selection. This is very much a low light. Um, Listeners may recall or have heard that uh, a few weeks ago in France, uh, about a thousand servicemen and women and 20 retired generals put their names on a letter that uh, warned the French people that uh, the country was in danger of descending into a civil war if it didn't take a stand uh, against, among other things, the importation of woke ideas from the United States and, you know, take a stand against Muslim immigrants and things like this. Uh, the, uh, by the way, the Claremont Institute in this country translated and published this letter, probably because they, they found something bracing about it. Um, but just so that uh, Americans don't become uh, too complacent, it's, it turns out I've seen right now, as of yesterday, an article in uh, the uh, Huffington Post titled Former U.S. Military Leaders Signed Bizarre Open Letter Pushing Election Lies. And apparently over 120 retired generals and admirals have signed on to this letter falsely claiming the 2020 election was stolen. Uh, this includes John Poindexter, who many of us will remember, uh, back from, uh, the Reagan era, um, and a number of others whose names will not be household, uh, household recognized. Uh, they're not, uh, the biggest name people, not the people you necessarily see on uh, cable news regularly, but it does include retired Army Lieutenant General William Boykin, uh, who has said uh, some pretty bigoted things about Muslims over the years and uh, anti-LGBTQ stuff as well. So whatever the case, um, we clearly have a similar problem here as they have in France of uh, generals and former generals uh, intervening in politics on uh, the, uh, some of the crazier sides of debates. And it's distressing to think that uh, 120 or so of them uh, would do this on the side of our, our crazy ex-president, Donald Trump. <laughs> Wow. Um, I was not aware about Poindexter. Um, he was national security advisor, I believe, uh, for a while under he Reagan. Was. Yep. Yeah. He was. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. Um, I would like to, in the spirit of, that we began this podcast, the, the final segment uh, used to be highlighting something that somebody that you normally disagree with wrote that you wanted to agree with and, uh, so I have one of those this week. Um, Christine Emba, who is a columnist at the Washington Post um, and uh, considerably to my left, um, has published a piece called When It Comes to Biden's Child Care Provisions, the GOP Actually Has a Point. And she makes it clear that the idea of simply giving parents money and not prejudicing how they spend that money to care for their kids, whether it's using it to buy daycare or using it to permit one parent to be at home uh, is the better way to go. 
and that uh, for once uh, she finds something in a Republican proposal that uh, that she agrees with. So, uh, and that of course is part of the spirit of this podcast, hoping for a little bit of cross pollination. And so, um, hats off to Christine Emba. And we thank A.B. Stoddard for joining us. We thank all of you for listening. You can find my email if you want to mail me comments uh, over at thebulwark.com. And we will return next week as every week. 